All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Cybercognition Podcast. As always, I'm Hutch. I'm a innovation principal at Trace3, where we follow emerging enterprise technology. I also am the creator of the Sociosploit blog and the author of the book, The Language of Deception, Weaponizing Next Generation AI. And I'm Len. I am a technical evangelist, transhuman, and a white hat for CyberArk. And I am a thought leader in the transhuman and human plus space. And ha as always, we are here to expand your mind. Awesome. And today we've got a really great episode. As always, we're going to look at some recent news articles. We're going to look at a Waymo car that was set on fire in San Francisco during a protest. We're going to look at some new updates around research related to fusion energy. And then, of course, we can't overlook the fact that Apple has now released the Vision Pro unleashing a whole new era of glass holes. And then we're going to do the, the main segment where we talk about the doomsday clock, what that is, some of the history around it, and why it may or may not matter to you. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, so news. Uh, if you've been paying attention to some of our recent podcasts, me and Hutch actually had a conversation last time about who, which one of us actually would be willing to get in an autonomous vehicle. And... I'm not going to answer that. Go go listen. It was actually a great episode. But here's the thing. So we have this mob going off in San Francisco. And, and with all the research I did, it there, there there's some people who are saying, you know, an autonomous vehicle hit somebody. Other people are saying that it was not the autonomous vehicle that hit someone. But regardless, the autonomous vehicle turned into a barbecue. And... Let's see, from the, from the futurist perspective, I'm looking at this and I see a lot more of this stuff happening, you know, from a social human interaction perspective, it's a lot easier for me to just go up and start busting out something that's not going to swing back at me. On top of the fact, this is still some future technology that we are still working the bugs out of. I mean, even the the autopilot for, for some of the autonomous driving or the self-driving functions in some of the cars, you know, we, we've had discussions about the technologies being updated around that. This is going to continue to happen. I mean, even in, in yours and mine home state here at Texas, I just heard something the other day that they are now working to try and outfit I-35, which is one of our major thoroughfares for autom autonomous trucks. So we're, it's not even just the cars anymore. Now we're going to have freight. We're going to have large, heavy vehicles that do not have the same stopping capabilities as a taxi running up and down major freeways. You know, this is something I personally, I know we're not going to be able to stop it, but we need to start watching this as a society. You know, we're, we're basically just throwing this out there and letting everybody make legislation on technology that is still in the, still in the, in the kitchen cooking. So in all honesty, if we're going to do some angry mob stuff out there, I would rather you do some, do it against something that is not going to cause anybody any physical harm. I am not in, in any way endorsing any type of violence, but let's be honest. I can only see this continuing to happen. I mean, what do you think, man? Yeah, I absolutely agree. First of all, I, I love the term barbecue. Um, de definitely did not see that one coming. Oh, um, dude, uh, for just for, just for I have to interrupt for just one second. That is a tribute back to my hometown. Thank you, Detroit. You'll, you're going to hear <laughs> a lot of interesting Detroitisms come out as we do these. <laughs> do you see your fair amount of barbecues in Detroit? Oh yeah, I mean, especially up in East Lansing. I mean, the Spartans. If they win a game, you know, Sparty on everybody. But yeah, if if they win a, a major sporting event, everything goes up. Couches, cars, you name it. it yep. It's kind of a, a Michigan thing. You know, we're, we're tough. So I I guess for a little bit of context, what happened here, we've got, uh, as, as Lynn mentioned, there's there was discussions around who was at fault, but there was a pedestrian that was hit, not severely, nobody was seriously injured, 
the guy walked away, uh, but was hit by a Waymo vehicle. And so far, most of the controversy in San Francisco has fallen to Cruise, which is the other self-driving vehicle company who has actually since pulled their vehicles. Waymo is still operating in San Francisco. And it was fascinating to see the the videos on this. If you, if you get a chance to look at them, definitely check it out because it it was almost that weird dystopian future of man versus machine where you've got these people that have surrounded this autonomous vehicle that are breaking out the windows that are graffitiing it and then of course setting the whole thing on fire and it was it, it was, was really strange to watch it was terrifying as somebody that's part machine to watch i gotta tell you you know yeah, it, it an autonomous vehicle the next thing you know i'm being burned at the stake it almost seems like the next level of evolution of we've we've always known people to kind of lash out at their Alexa devices or stuff like that. And it, it's easy to do so because, you know, there is uh, nothing sentient, nothing with feelings behind it. And I, this almost felt like kind of the next iteration of that. But it, it was it was definitely strange and, and kind of foreshadowing, like you said, to, to what I think we're going to see a lot more of as we continue to see more integration of machines into our daily lives. Yeah, it, it's going to get interesting, you know, but remember people at the end of the day, even by make, doing acts like this, it may not have feelings, but the fire you see there is real and people can still get hurt. So we do not advocate for any type of violence or destruction against anyone or anything. Absolutely. All right. Next one. So the next article that we were looking at was, uh, so a couple of months ago, just for background on this, there were a number of different researchers that were able to generate a fusion reaction that produced more output energy than was used as input. And so this was really the first time in human history where we we're able to feasibly demonstrate that we may be able to actually harness the power of fusion energy, which is essentially the the energy, the most natural energy source we know, the, the power of the sun. the sun. And there was a lot of speculation, but now, a couple months later, we have other researchers that have been able to independently validate the success of that experiment. And not only were they able to independently validate it, but actually were able to produce significantly more. Uh, I think in the first experiment, it was just marginally more power that they were able to output versus what was input. In this case, they actually doubled the amount of energy coming out of it. So what's, I mean, obviously there's a lot of potential opportunity here with fusion energy. The Input materials are extremely abundant, so it is a, a very sustainable source of energy, a potential alternative in terms of green energy and moving away from the, the carbon emission era. So definitely exciting. I think there's still a, a long runway before this is anywhere close to production ready, but some exciting news for the future. Absolutely. And one main point that I think you missed out when you were mentioning, you know, all the benefits, you know, like you said, you can get, you know, the hydrogen out of seawater. But one thing that if people are not aware of, unlike what we are dealing with now in terms of nuclear energy, if this thing goes offline, there is no meltdown. The only thing that breaks is the machine. There's no major destruction that, you know, and the, in terms of the radiation fallout, minimal compared to anything that we're dealing with by today's standards. So this is absolutely fascinating and definitely something that we need to actually keep our eye on because, you know, the idea of being able to harness the power of the sun, that goes far beyond just electrical power. That's propulsion. That's everything. So we're on the cusp of, of some, potentially the, the fusion era. I mean, we've, we've talked about this, the bronze era, you know, the, you know, the, the industrial revolution, you know, the digital era, this is going to be one of those points in the human roadway where we're going to make a sharp term when we can actually get this under, you know, productive and profitable and, you know, usable quantities. 
Yep, exciting news for sure. So with that, Lynn, do you want to tell us about the third article we're going to discuss here? Okay, um, we, we've we've been working this, you know, some of the the kinks and, and you know, and the, some of the formats to the show out since adding me and and Hutch did an amazing job of of last week of getting on the soapbox, but this week we decided rather than to dedicate an entire slide to it, we're both just going to take a few seconds and uh, and then we'll actually talk about it. But l if you haven't seen what's going on with Apple's Vision Pro releases. The stupidity of the human being is on full display. I am freely admitting that I am not like everybody else. And, you know, and I love technology and I want to integrate it into my life. But I don't want to look like a marionette walking around doing, you know, or, or, or like I'm having some kind of, of medical episode as I'm crossing the street. Additionally, you know, you've got people who are using self-driving functions on their cars and having meetings what point have we we you know I, i've said it to you before hutch anytime we add convenience it's not adding anything that's making us safer how do we start safeguarding against our own stupidity and the stupidity of others and i want to tack on one last question what's worse autonomous vehicles or glass holes in self-driving cars having, a, you know, a, an executive briefing as they're going down the freeway. They're yeah, up. agreed. You know, I'd say neither one is ideal. Uh, I, I think it's worth double-clicking into the glass holes topic. So for anybody that isn't aware about, I, I don't know, it, it's got, it seems like almost a decade ago, Google released a product that was somewhat similar. It was an augmented reality set of glasses that I, I don't think had a whole lot of functionality. I know that it was able to record people and there was concerns over privacy. And so anybody that was wearing these Google Glass products, were what they were called, were dubbed glass holes. And of course, the videos that you would see, the pictures that you would see of people walking around with this are very reminiscent of what we're now seeing with no, this is even worse, Apple especially Pro. with all the gestures. I oh, mean, agreed. And this this thing is enormous on your face, too. Yeah, I mean, at least back then, if you, even with the Google Glass, it was like you know, just this like little, almost like a HUD kind of a heads up thing. These people, you know, all we got to do is just put a couple of googly eyes on the front of this, and, and there's content for an entire YouTube channel. Just follow them around and add music. Wait for him to fall into a manhole. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's so I actually I, I think they're interesting. I would like to try one of these headsets, admittedly, at some point, because I, I do think that there's potentially some productivity value in spatial computing. Right now, I think that it's extremely limited. My understanding is that even if you have a MacBook, you can only do one virtual display, which doesn't really increase my level of productivity. But mm -hmm. I, I think that to the extent that they can expand upon that, there may be some value here. But I certainly don't think there's value in walking around with it attached to your face. Because going back to our previous episode where we talked about the future of idiocracy, the fact that technology is really introducing some significant problems into society. I think that this is one more example of something that is socially isolationist, that it removes us from the typical day-to-day -day social interactions that we have with real people and moving us further into our own siloed world. And I think that Absolutely. as we talked about in our, our last episode, I think that there's some significant social problems with that. Absolutely. And you know, I agree with you. I, I've seen some some different things and, and the technology and the potential to the technology is absolutely phenomenal from a business perspective. But, you know, from for a consumer market, I think this is going to cause nothing but pain. But, you know, as Nero said once, I'm just going to play my fiddle and sit back and watch it all burn. Yep. It'll be fun to watch, if nothing else. Amen. All righty. So now we're going to get down to it. The doomsday clock. Yep. So I think a lot of people, when they hear the term doomsday clock, a lot of people probably are not familiar with the history of this and the fact that it is actually a real thing. It is not just a metaphor for the end of the world. And so I think before we 
talk about kind of some of our opinions and thoughts on the Doomsday Clock. It's important here to set the stage and talk about some of the history behind the Doomsday Clock itself. So, of course, created in 1947 by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And this had some pretty heavy hitters in terms of scientific innovation that were some of the initial founding members, everything from Robert, Opp or Robert Oppenheimer and also Albert Einstein were among some of the original founding members. And the idea of the Doomsday Clock was to create a sense of awareness in the public about how close we are to a potential man-made catastrophe. That, that would be of something of global scale, global, something like an extinction level event. Extinction. Yep. So when originally created, it was set to seven minutes to midnight during the height of the Cold War. We move, and the idea here is the metaphor is that the closer we get to midnight, midnight is doomsday. The it's the end, exactly. So uh, originally seven minutes to midnight during the height of the Cold War, we were up to two minutes to midnight. And as of January 23rd, 2024, so just last month, it moved to the closest it's ever been to midnight. So we are now 90 seconds to midnight. Uh, so given that history, uh, Lynn, what are your thoughts on the doomsday clock as far as a, a lot of people have kind of dismissed it as alarmist. Other people think that there's value here. Uh, the truth is probably somewhere in between, but what are your thoughts? I honestly think it, 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 I think it, when it was originally created, I think it had a purpose, but honestly, I feel like it has become more of a propaganda tool that is more of a political tool than an actual representation of what is going on in terms of global humanity and our existential threats to our future. Yeah, and I think I think you're probably right to some extent. I think that there is, unfortunately, everything these days is so politicized, and it's hard to address something that isn't going to have some kind of influence on government regulation without pulling politics into it. I think, yeah, and unfortunately, man, I, I gotta check you on something because I be I believe, and I'm double checking this right now. It's not that it was just set to 90 seconds. It was kept at 90 seconds. So I do believe, yeah, it, the clock remains at 90 seconds. So it is actually at the same as it was at when it was checked. In, or I believe so, it, 2023 is when it went to 90 seconds. Yep. Appreciate that clarification. So still the closest that it's been, but remaining the same. Absolutely. So personally, I, I think that there is some value here. I do agree that there is definitely a level of alarmist tone to this just by the very nature of the metaphor. But I do think that there is something about human beings naturally that we have this optimism bias. And if you look at the way that we are optimized by natural selection, we have a natural tendency to worry about immediate risk, things that the lion that's in the bush right down the road. I, worrying about those immediate risks is what kept people alive long enough to reproduce and pass their genetics on. What there is no biological incentive for is worrying about larger existential risk, the idea of a global catastrophe that could result in something like an extinction level event. And not only is there no natural optimizer for worrying about global catastrophe, if anything, I think there's possibly the opposite where if you are worrying about these larger risks, potentially at the cost of paying attention to the immediate risks, if anything, I think we're, we're naturally optimized to not worry about those things. So I think that combined with the for most people, the optimism bias, I think that the doomsday clock, while it is politically charged, while it does have some kind of alarmist level to it, I think that there also is some value for providing that counter perspective of making people aware of that existential risk that I think a lot of people just don't worry about. Well, I mean, let's take a look at it. What it, You know, when it was originally adopted, it was brought up in terms of a 
an atomic threat at the time. And we've tried to continue to build on that. But, you know, at this point, what actually qualifies as, you know, an extinction level event or an existential threat to humanity? You know, realistically, we could say the climate situation and, and we're not going to get into the whole is global warming a thing or not. We can just look at the trends even here in Texas between you and I. I mean, last summer, you know, it was hot. It was hotter than anything I've ever experienced. So let's err on the side of caution and say things are changing. You know, it, how do we address that and include those kind of threats? We have artificial intelligence. You know, and we both have said in, you know, other conversations privately and publicly that, you know, we both feel that artificial intelligence could potentially be one of the ex largest existential threats to humanity. But at the same time, it could also be one of the greatest influences for change and benefit to mankind. So how do we, you know, like you said in the beginning, we're trying to use what was defined back in, in the 1950s to a world that that doesn't really fit into anymore. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. Things have changed so much. This was originally focused on just nuclear risk, and it feels like, if anything, we've got more potential candidates for existential risk than we had to worry about before. And I, I think a lot of that is just related to technological pro or progress. I, I think agree. that I think that almost every single one of these potentially existential level risks that we face is largely can be reduced down to the idea of the law of unintended consequences. It's that as we have more complexity that's built into a system, when you interact with those increasingly complex systems, the likelihood of something happening that is unintended or unexpected becomes higher as that system becomes more complex. And as we continue to move forward in a world that has increasing technological complexity, whether you're talking about weapon systems, whether you're talking about AI, uh, whether you're talking about even just the complexity of our socio-political economic interactions between countries, all of that is increasing day over day in complexity. And so with each of, with that progressive change, we are also seeing the risk of unexpected events occurring. And I think that that's really where we see almost every single one of these coming down to. But I think there's probably it's probably worth drilling down into each one of these. Um, the the continued nuclear proliferation threat. I think we are seeing countries that are continuing to expand their arsenals, uh, modernize well, their even, nuclear weapons. Even beyond you know new people adding you know back you know on February nineteenth, you know Russia or wrong article actually no November second, you know Vladimir Putin removed. Russia from uh, the Russians ratification of the nuclear test ban treaty. So not only do we have new people coming in, we have people that were already in that are coming out. Yep. And are disregarding that those previous agreements, I think largely due to, and I think each one of these different factors is definitely entangled. We've got the risk of nuclear proliferation, but at the same time, we have these increased wars. And I think the factor of Russia pulling out of previous nuclear arms agreements is likely due to tension created by the existing war that they have with Ukraine, the tension between Russia and NATO as a result of that, and also between the United States as well. Yeah, absolutely. But, I, I, but it definitely but introduces an interesting new twist that that makes this even more challenging than it was before you know you know but if i can circle this back to you know the doomsday clock and the uh uh the the uh, bullet of atomic scientists i mean i'm gonna quote here you know from rachel bronson make no mistake resetting the clock at 90 seconds to midnight is not an indication that the world is stable quite the opposite it's urgent for governments and communities around the world to act and the bulletin remains hopeful and inspired in seeing the younger generation leading the change. So let, let me stop there for just one moment. You know, so we're, we're putting a lot of, 
the and and we are going to drill into these, but I, I want to go after the, that those guys one more time first. You know, we're putting all a lot of faith in the atomic clock or in the doomsday clock. You know, but at the end of the day, do you know who's actually making these decisions? You know, we're talking. Uh, you know, we would you would think that this would be a very large committee, but according to their own website, the on the Bulletin of Atomic Science and Security Board, in consultation with its board of sponsors, which includes nine lore, uh, Nobel laureates, we don't know who are on this list. Who else? I mean, I bet that is one thing that I've wanted to add right here. I've been looking through here, and I'm sure that there's a way to find it, you know, but I haven't been able to actually find everybody that's involved in making these decisions. And even if we stick to the first bullet point in terms of continued nuclear proliferation, if we just look at what's been come out in the news in the last, you know, seven days, you know, Ronald Reagan start, was talking about Star Wars back in the 80s, and now we're living it here in 2024. So how can, you know, we not move, be closer to a nuclear, even just a nuclear, you know, threat when we're now talking about multiple countries trying to put nuclear arms up in space now. Yeah, you, you have to wonder if they didn't, in hindsight, think maybe we started this too close to midnight because how much can we incrementally move this closer before we just run out of being able to even say we're closer to doomsday than we were yesterday. But um, but it almost to me in her in her quote, it almost felt, felt like more of a pleading of, look, we're getting really bad here, guys. We got to do something. But to the point that you just made, if we started it farther away, would it make us any less close to some kind of actual disaster? Because I don't know about you, but everywhere you look, it seems like everything is just trying to spin out of control and it's everybody just trying their best to hold everything together right now. Yep. Agreed. So it, it almost sounds like your perspective is maybe the doomsday clock is not alarmist enough. We need to really pay attention to what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, that would be my suggestion. I mean, as somebody that's been around and spent, time traveling the world and in other countries and seeing different cultures you know if i look back you know there are are threats that you know look at what happened with covid19 you know and that's i know we're going to get to that because that's you know three bullet points down and i'm jumping ahead but you know that's something every single one of us here that are either you know that are listening we've all experienced what could happen you know that was supposed to be 14 days remember you know, we don't know what we don't know. And yet we're not, if we listen, look at this, the doomsday clock at face value, we're still sitting exactly the same distance from annihilation we were a year ago this time. And I, I personally, I don't think like we were any better than we were last year. And honestly, quite the opposite. <laughs> Yep, I, I would agree with that. I, I think that we are we we see things like what happened in, and I know this was this was at one point a controversial topic of the whole Wuhan lab experimentation. I think now, pretty much generally understood that there was a lab something. leak that took place, and there was and something that happened what, somewhere. What that says is that we have, and and of course Wuhan is not alone in the fact that they are doing experimentation on biological diseases that is happening Absolutely. in multiple research labs across the world and it's only a matter of time when you start playing with and for me i think biological weapons are almost more terrifying than chemical or nuclear because with chemical and nuclear while they are extremely dangerous weapons you can project based That's on the payload what the expected yield is, what the expected impact is. Biological so easily could get out of control, exactly like what we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic. And you could it's very easy to imagine something that is has a higher mortality rate and is has the same level of contagion that we saw with COVID-19 that could be while COVID-19 was extremely damaging, something that could be. COVID-19, I don't think was ever designed to be 
generally lethal to everyone it got. And I think what you're trying to say is if you're going to start playing with genetics and you want to try and do something nasty, there are, there are, I'm sure many ways to do it. And it could, COVID-19 could have been much worse. I am yeah. more terrified of a biological threat than any other thing out there. Like you said, bombs are predictable. You know, you, you can run simulations. When you get into biological, once it gets out into the wild, it can mutate. It can get away from you. There is nobody knows what's going to happen. And that is absolutely terrifying. And, you know, I'm even going to throw this out there. I, I wonder in some ways if having gone through the pandemic, could this actually work against us as a society for the next type of biological threat that comes around? Because we've all locked down once and it didn't take us all out. So, you know, like you said, we're, the human animal is going to just become numb his, to it. He's going to pull from his experience. You know, I, I unfortunately, I, I think that, you know, a lot of the, and I'm not going to call out any agencies or anything by name, but I think a lot of the people that the public look to in the time of crisis whether it be COVID-19, the doomsday clock, I don't care which representation it is. I think a lot of faith has been lost due to technology and the ability for people to actually go out and do independent research. You know, we don't have Walter Cronkite out there giving us the news, you know, and those are the facts. I don't care if you like them or, or don't. That's what happened. You know, the, mm -hmm. you know there was no spin on it. I can tell you personally, I don't have the same confidence in, you know, the information that I'm getting from the crisis management people. I mean, it's hard to find unbiased information these days. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it is a challenge. One, one thing that I think is interesting since we're talking about biological threats is Lynn, you recently made a recommendation to me to watch a documentary on Netflix that was Unnatural Selection. Absolutely. And I highly recommend to anybody that is listening. It was a great documentary. But one thing that I found fascinating, so I was already aware of the CRISPR technology and the potential use of that for manipulating one's own genome. And there, there are some very interesting use cases for that. We're starting to see actual authorized FDA approved use cases. Just recently, we saw a CRISPR technology that was used to treat sickle cell anemia and seems to be working very effectively. And uh, one thing that was interesting. There's another CRISPR based treatment for certain cases of genetic blindness. So one thing that was interesting to me in that documentary was they talked about the, of course, the idea of somebody using CRISPR to genetically modify a single organism doesn't terrify me. But what was interesting was they talked about this idea of a gene drive, basically a way of manipulating a system that is then re or a an organism that is then reintroduced into their ecosystem and spreads that genetic modification to all of its offspring. Yep. And the idea that you could, and, and to me, that seems terrifying, the possibility of not just manipulating a single organism, but the cascading impacts that could result from manipulating an entire ecosystem. Yep. And again, when we talk about law of unintended consequences, that seems to be a perfect example of it's impossible to know when you make just a minor change and then you introduce it to all of the hereditary offspring from that point forward into an ecosystem, the potential impacts that that could have on the environment, on organisms in that same ecosystem, even on us as humans. Oh my God. Yeah. The, now we're starting to play with things at a cellular level and, you know, to your point, man, unnatural selection, that movie, actually that documentary actually opened my eyes and that was one of the things that started running me down a lot of the, the the genetic rabbit holes that i've been looking at you know and you know there there have been studies done there could we potentially at this point designer build an infant in utero yes 
You want to have a kid that is born immune to sickle cell anemia. We can do that. You know, once we they can find a way to potentially integrate these into, say, HIV treatments, you know, instead of, you know, mo pregnant mothers giving birth to, you know, already infected children, you might be able to save the, the fetus in utero through genetic therapy. But will that potentially cause some type of issue three generations down the line? We don't know. Yep. And that's, that's, what's interesting to me is people often talk about the, I think one, probably a lot of people don't realize that that technology already exists. It does. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of the resistance related to that technology is ethical in nature, which Absolutely. for, for me, I mean, I, I, I understand, I, I can sympathize with people that have those feelings, but for me, it has nothing to do with ethics. It's the, concern of what are the potential consequences that we cannot foresee in making changes like well, this gen at the at the genetic level well uh, let's be honest you know it's not as severe as crispr but the entire globe just ex participated in, in in an experiment that you know some of the vaccines were uh what is it mrna or excuse me I'm oh yeah you yep. know mrna based yeah, mRNA, you know, so so we're still playing in the same, you know, arena. You know, we don't know if this stuff is going to pass on, you know, we we're playing in the same field. We don't know if good Lord willing in the, the crypt don't rise. I hope, you know, five years from now, I don't start growing orange feathers out of my hair. But can we honestly say that isn't going to happen? Probably because yep. feathers don't grow out of humans, but you, you get the point. Yeah, and I, I think it's worth taking a step back here and saying that by no means are we advocating an anti-vax agenda. But at the same oh. time, I think that these are questions that you need to ask anytime that you're introducing new technology. And that is, you're right. Uh, essentially, when we talk about mRNA vaccines, that is a new technology that we have very little experience, very little history with. And uh, I, I think that sometimes maybe we're too quick to shut down questioning as opposition to. Absolutely. I am all I'm all for advances in medical science. I, I think that it's extremely important that we move those forward. But I do think that there also needs to be a voice of opposition in all cases. And that's that's not necessarily an anti-vax agenda. That's not necessarily no. we, we need to, to stop the, the medical no. progress. I, one thing, you know, and especially as we start talking into some of the more transhuman topics, you know, I'm the first person to say that I don't believe anybody should have to do anything against their will, period. You know, if, if you, you're a vax person, I respect your choice. If you're an unvax person, I respect your choice. I'm, I agree with you. And what I'm saying is I, I wish that there was more time to do long-term studies. And we can all agree that, you know, any new drug that's coming out on the market, let's say it's a blood pressure pill, maybe it's an anxiety pill, maybe it's, you know, a weight loss pill. There is a rigorous FDA process that go that it has to happen before these things are approved in a normal set of circumstance. Those those were not the circumstances we got. We had to deal with the situation the best we could. You know, it doesn't matter at this point. We're all vaccinated or we're not. So those of us that are, and I am, you know, whatever the long-term effects of that are, I'm going to have to deal with it, but I'm here today and, and I don't regret my decisions. So uh, I, I think another one that is worth talking about here is the topic of artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I think that there is some nuance here because I think that there are some significant cyber threats related to AI that could be catastrophic, but I don't think they're necessarily catastrophic on an extinction level scale in a lot of cases. I think that we're talking about potential damage to information systems. But I, I think that there are a few cases where we see the integration of artificial intelligence into the military operations and the defense world that we do see some serious areas for concern. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, Lynn, you followed this, but there was uh, an R&D group that was actually doing some study around potential candidate chemicals for 
medication for helping people. And they basically just flipped a bit. They changed it from look for stuff that is non-toxic to humans to something that is toxic for humans. And we're able to use a machine learning system in order to identify, I I don't remember the number, but I, I think it was in the area of thousands of different potential chemical compounds that could be weaponized. Absolutely. You know, I think I, we've, we, I've said this before. Large language models and AI right now are, are teenage children that have already know all the bad words, know what they're not supposed to do. And the only reason they're not doing it is because we're telling it don't. You know, the thing that's scaring me is we're, oh, I'm looking there. You would know this better than I. There was just something that was just released a couple of days ago about something in terms of open, chat gpt finally being able to do future projection so they did introduce a memory feature to chat gpt in the last few days that's um, where it where it does and and there's there's fortunately it seems like it's relatively transparent you can see what it is recording about you so it's not it's not really assigning it to the the model itself. It's not building it into the model's understanding. It's really just modifying the context with instructions on things that it's observed that are consistently relevant to you. I think there are some privacy concerns there. I think that uh, the fact that you can manage that does address some of those privacy concerns, but it does show that we're more and more trying to move in a direction of making it more seamlessly personalized, which I think may have some benefits for some people, but is also going to be creepy and problematic in other cases. It's going to make my life as somebody that's trying to steal your information a lot more easy. But I I have to agree. I don't really see artificial intelligence as in its current, current inception as an existential threat on its own. Now, knowledge that somebody may be able to get from it to create some kind of of catastrophe, absolutely. But AI on its own, it's data. It's not sentient. It doesn't care. It doesn't, it's not good. It's not bad. It's just data. So no, again, I, I see AI, you know, as more just kind of the tutor for the stupid human. Yep. I I think there was, so there was an interesting article that recently came out or a research paper that came out from RAND, which is a think tank that looks at a lot of diplomatic and international policy issues. And they broke down some of the future strategies that Russia and specifically Vladimir Putin is currently pursuing in order to increase the automation and the use of machine learning in their military operations, uh, specifically in Ukraine. And it addressed this concept that we're seeing increasingly becoming a problem in military operations, this idea of laws, which is lethal autonomous weapon systems. The idea of creating weapon systems that you provide it kind of a general vague objective of what it's trying to achieve. But from there, it goes out, it does on On its own, it does the identification of the target, even up to making the determination to execute or lethally kill that target. So I think that that is an extremely concerning direction because, of course, once one country does it, then other countries have to follow suit. And we see the the typical arms race. And I mean it with this with all due respect. Is there any... Thing with your former military background, you know, and, and as always, thank you for your service. You know, is there any? I know there there are certain laws in terms of like the Geneva Convention. Is there anything out there for in terms of autonomous weapons? I mean, is there? Is, does it fall under any current type of treaties that you know global treaties? No, there is absolutely nothing. There's been some discussion. There has actually been quite a few different political leaders in the United States who have been very clear about the fact that they don't want to see military operations go down that road. But at the same time, it's something that we are not willing to take off the table because if somebody else does it, how can you essentially we have to do it as well. And so we have that traditional prisoner's dilemma, the same thing that we saw play out during the cold war where we saw. And to that point, man, 
you know, I just looked up this stat right before we came on. And, you know, as of the 19th of February, 2024, currently there's nine countries out there possessing nuclear weapons. And the known global nuclear stockpile is close to 13,000 weapons with, you know, anywhere between 5,000 and down per country. And that's just the weapons. You know, yep. and, and, and keep in mind, this is after we've also, at post-Cold War, we, that there was a massive effort to try and decommission a lot of these old nuclear weapons. So this is even down from there. And now we're trying to build more and stick them in places that we've never had them. What's interesting is, and I think that a lot of people who haven't specifically researched the nuclear arms race and nuclear weapons probably don't realize this, but the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, uh, if I recall correctly, I think they were in the area of 15 to 20 kilotons, which this is how we measure nuclear weapons is basically the amount of tons of TNT that the explosion would be equivalent to. So when we talk in terms of kilotons, we're talking about the equivalent of X number of thousands of tons of TNT. So in the area of 15 to 20 thousand tons of TNT. Now, all of our newer nuclear weapons that we made during the Cold War as we continued this back and forth proliferation, we moved away from kilotons and we are now measuring these systems in terms of megatons. So that is hundreds of thousands of tons of TNT. And so we, uh, the largest nuclear weapon that was ever launched was by Russia, which was the, the Tsar Bomba. And if I recall correctly, I think that was in the area between 50 and 100 megatons. So thousands of orders of magnitude more powerful than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It is generally understood that that is probably not the most powerful weapon out there, that there probably are nuclear warheads that are even bigger than that. And that had unbelievable impacts on the environment. That was launched over the Arctic Ocean and if, unbelievable. If I can break in for a second here, Hutch. When sure. did that happen? Because that I honestly I, I wasn't familiar with that one. I mean, was that eighties, nineties, two thousands? Let's see. That was detonated in sixty one, actually, over the Arctic Ocean. Sixty one. So, hmm. so uh, that, 50, 50, 50 megatons, three thousand three hundred times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Wow. Well, and so, and, and that's, that's, that's still just scratching the surface. So we have, we now have nuclear weapons that uh, a lot of scientists believe if they were ever detonated would create basically what they've referred to as a nuclear winter. It's this idea that the mushroom cloud resulting from this would be so significant that it would obstruct a large part of our atmosphere from the rays that we get from the sun, basically triggering a next ice age. Yep. I've heard that so, too. So it's, it's really terrifying when we think about kind of where we've moved in. And it's very easy to forget on a day-to-day -day basis that at any given moment, there are a handful of a few people in very high, powerful positions in the world that could essentially end the world like that. I think one fascinating situation that happened was back in 2018 when everybody in Hawaii got that emergency oh, yeah. on I their phone. That. They, they, everybody got uh, a notification that basically said, take shelter, a incoming, missile has been fired and is, missile. impact is imminent. And I think that was, so the, the warning was an accident. It should have never gone out. But I do think that it was a wake-up call for a lot of people that, again, at any moment, while that one wasn't true, what they were warning about could have happened at any time. Absolutely. We live in very, very strange times. And if we start to try and circle it back to the original question of the doomsday clock, is it good for something? I guess it depends on, number one, whether or not you believe that we're that close to extinction or not. I think it's a representation of the, the fear of annihilation. But in terms of factual you know, usable data that I can look at and, and use to interpret in my life. I think over the course of this conversation, at least from my perspective, we've basically debunked the idea that it's impartial. 
And so therefore, maybe as a societal tool to try and bring awareness, like you said, to the fact that there are larger threats out there beyond whether or not, you know, you know, there's a, I'm going to be late to work because uh, I'm stuck in line at Starbucks for my Frappuccino. You know, there's, there's real stuff that could kill us all going on out there. And this does at least make you think about it at least once a year. So I, I guess it can't be all bad. Yep. And one thing that I did want to finish up on, um, I think that whether whatever amount of stake you put into the doomsday clock itself, the executive chair of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists did say this with the latest update. And I think that this is kind of a powerful statement. He said, as though on the Titanic, leaders are steering the world toward catastrophe. More nuclear bombs, vast carbon emissions, dangerous pathogens, and artificial intelligence. And this is what really stuck with me is he then said, only the big powers like China, America, and Russia can pull us back. Despite deep antagonisms, they must cooperate or we are doomed. And I, I think that that is the most important takeaway, regardless of whether the doomsday clock itself is politicized or if there's value in really following the particular publications of it. When we talk about existential risk, we are increasingly getting to a world that is interconnected and the risks of this side of the world are just as relevant to the other side of the world. And I think that we have to get to a point where we, and by we, I don't mean the US, I, I mean humanity itself. We have to get to a point where we can set aside our differences, where we can get away of this antagonistic fear of the other and finally get on the same page with so many of these different issues that are becoming increasingly problematic across society. There's a... a a shop that I ran across once and it was in the Netherlands and it said, I am a global citizen because I am a human on this world. And that, that struck me. And, you know, ever the pessimist you are, Hutch, you know, I, I agree with you. I just look at it a little bit differently because China, America, Russia, you know, I'll even throw India in there. You know, all anyone that I have ever ran across anywhere in the world for them, you know, with little to no exception, the people, we are all the same. Doesn't matter if I'm here in Europe, if I'm in South America, the person I meet on the street, we're all the same. We want to have a good job. We want to uh, take care of our families. We want to be able to, you know, pay our bills, and, you know, and live a peaceful life. You know, the politics of the world is, is what I find to be scary because, you know, if you put me and you next to somebody, you know, any other Joe Blow on the street and you put us all in a lineup, you know, we all bleed red. You know, we all put our pants on the same way. You know, and I, and I wish for a better future, you know, and I, I, I'm going to have to piggyback on your optimism. And in the meantime, I'm, we're just going to have to keep doing our job and trying to get people to start seeing these kinds of challenges and start having conversations. Because if nothing else, being ignorant is a choice. There's always an opportunity to learn. I like it. Open dialogue is going to be absolutely critical going forward. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll uh, go ahead and wrap it up on that positive note. Um, any final words, Lynn? Not until next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Cybercognition over and out. Peace.